Hi, it's Fleet Week in New York City, and Ars Technica is here next to the aircraft carrier Intrepid. We're checking out Woods Hole Oceanographic's research vessel, Neil Armstrong, which is only a year old. Unfortunately, we don't have to swim to get on the vessel, but we might have to swim back to the subway. You, know, you remember the shuttles were, were named after oceanographic ships. You know, Challenger Endeavor was Captain Cook's ship. This is the first ship where they flip it around and uh, we're naming them after uh, astronauts. There's a sister ship to this called the Sally Ride and she's on the west coast. So the ship is about a year old, built in uh, Anacortes, Washington. It's owned by the Navy for the benefit of the nation, really. And what happens is scientists put in proposals to uh, use the ship. So it's like getting telescope time for an astronomy. Yeah, exactly right. This is a, a meteorological mast where they put you know, atmospheric instrumentation. You know, it takes wind speed, things like that. And they also has iceberg lights in case you get too far north run into icebergs. So 20 uh, crew and uh, room for 24 scientists. Uh, generally when the scientists are on board they barely sleep. This particular crew had been on a previous ship called the Noor which had operated mm -hmm. for 40 years. And the, these are the captains, chiefs, mates, or even the masters have uh, access to the hospital. They're all medically trained. They can do so many different things here, from splinting to even sutures, surgical interventions, catheters. It's also what's cool about this vessel itself is that it has a, uh, an IC unit component, which um, you can hook up to any patient. It'll actually read a cardiac rhythm and then transmit that cardiac rhythm on shore to a doctor who you can communicate with directly. Yeah, it's pretty neat. The other thing that's interesting about this ship, it's uh, ADA equipped. So if you'll notice, the hallways are, are wide. And we have two scientists at Woods Hole who are blind, and they go out on ships. It was fascinating. One of them, as soon as she came on this ship, you know, she just said, this is, I mean, the hallways, it's so great. I can, I can negotiate. I don't bump into things. Mm -hmm. and, and it makes my job a whole lot easier. This is our steering wheel. No, no big ship's wheel anymore. Two main propulsion units, they're, uh, they're hooked up to controllable pitch propellers. So it's sort of like an airplane mm -hmm. that we can change the direction of the blade. So the shaft turns in one direction all the time. We just change the direction of the blade and it, it directs thrust either fore or aft. We have a stern thruster that does side to side thrust and a bow thruster that's omnidirectional. So it's a water jet basically. Okay. It takes it in, shoots it out and we can turn it any direction. The two farthest over to port are the uh, engineering displays. Mm -hmm. The engineers wisely lock us out of being able to make changes. <laughs> They're more acoustic sonar instruments, including something called an EK-80, which has a range of bandwidths, so that it can visualize everything from the seafloor, it can visualize fish, it can visualize tiny plankton. This is Neil Armstrong's Congressional Gold Medal, which his wife, Carol Armstrong, gave to the institution and to the ship. In the past, what would happen is you drag something, you know, tow something along the bottom and hope you run into methane bubbles, sprinkle one out. This way, you know, you can see them and then say, oh, Harder. that's exactly where they are, and then put your instrument down. Right. Oh, did you see that? That's methane bubbles huh. coming up. The main laboratory is infinitely configurable because we're a general purpose research vessel, so we have to be adaptable from one cruise to the next. We could be doing geology, one, one cruise come in, we have two days to turn the ship around and start doing biology. We have a number of sonar systems aboard. This display here is, shows our multi-beam sonar system. This is a uh, sonar that provides a wide swath of sound to, onto the seafloor and kind of in a fan-shaped pattern on either side of the vessel. So as the vessel's moving around, we're getting a very, very detailed picture of what the seafloor looks like. We have a whole section of the ship that's dedicated to sonar transducers down here. It's so critical to the nature of what we do that they've, made, they've dedicated this transducer bay to it. On the floor, each one of these round shapes is a, uh, is a cover to a specific transducer. 
that's for one of these systems right. at different frequencies. And we have dozens of these scattered about this uh, this space. So you can see the ship was pretty much designed around the sonars because right. they are such a critical um, tool for what we do. The ship has also been designed to be very, very quiet. Sonars operate most efficiently when your radiated noise from the ship is low. So that's an emergency escape from probably one of the engines, engine room spaces. <laughs> So we have to keep that clear no matter what else we do. So there are four diesel engines that we have that supply power to the whole ship and also to the motors, the port starboard motor. This side is, okay, the switchboard on the other side is the blue drive, which is the variable frequency drive for the motors. The difference between what the NOR had was the DC motors, and we have AC motors. Most of the time we have an issue, we just reboot it. And... <laughs> How often is that? Well, enough. <laughs> So these are the main motors. This is the port motor, the starboard motor over there. This has got a central freshwater cooling system. So it's a lot of copper nickel pipe that they used. The reverse osmosis units are up there on that deck. The ship uses a high fog system for firefighting. We don't use CO2 or anything like that. It's just a high pressure fog. It's amazing how quick and how little water is required to put out a fire. So there's not even added chemicals, it's just... No, nope, just water. That's the standard tool of oceanography, CTD, it's called. It stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. And essentially it's, it's lowered on a line uh, you know, pretty much to the bottom and then sort of slowly brought back up on the line. And those bottles get triggered at, you know, various depths that the scientists want to take samples at. So what you're looking at is a system, very simply, to listen for whales and to tell us about the sounds the whales make in real time. We're using this uh, technology to hopefully prevent ship strikes for, for whales. Ship strikes are a big problem, and so this is a technology to tell ships, to tell scientists when whales are present. The way it works is there's an instrument that was developed by engineers at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, it has a couple of hydrophones in it, very much like your microphone, only works underwater. There's a digital uh, signal processor in here that I wrote software for that does a detection for of the of uh, sounds, characterizes the sounds. If they're whale sounds, it'll uh, try to figure out uh, what species is making the call. Sends it through the Iridium satellite system to a, a computer in my lab. We display the data immediately uh, on a publicly accessible website that dcs.hui.edu. And then we have an analyst that uh, reviews the information that decides what species is there. Michael Moore uh, has projects with drones where they're going out with, into a partnership with NOAA and they're photographing whales with drones to look for scars, body size, and things like that. And then at the same time, they're sampling the microbiome of the whale blow. Uh, but they have a petri dish kind of strapped onto these drones and they fly through the spray when the whale blows. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Remus is a class of autonomous underwater vehicles that was invented at Huey and it was commercialized because the Navy took on as its, its pride and joy of its AUV fleet because at the time it was invented 22 years ago there wasn't anything quite like it to do um, a lot of covert Navy operations. We have this is a 100 meter vehicle that's a 600 meter vehicle we go all the way down to 6,000 meters. Some of our applications they're varied and for a long time there were a lot of military applications and so my job is to develop I take on my job to develop science applications. We develop new vehicles and do all the R&D, sensor development, software. One of the projects is, it's the, it's the only vehicle in the world that can three-dimensionally track a randomly moving fish in the ocean. So think, look at these vehicles as like one-stop shopping for oceanographic data. So they're like underwater aircraft carriers and they're the most highly uh, accurate navigators underwater. So you, they know where they're going, they, they, they're they reliable, they get to where they're going, that's and then they can carry. Signal. No, so that's a good question. So radio waves, radio signals um, don't work underwater, right. so we have to develop our own uh, communication systems underwater. And we, uh, 
there's plenty of animals out there that we were able to learn from, like you know, using acoustics. Right. So Remus found flight uh, Air France flight four four seven, right? And so we do that by flying off the seafloor, and in that case, you're flying 70 meters off the seafloor, and you can scan the seafloor 700 meters on either side with sonar. And so you pick up an anomaly in the side scan, this two-dimensional image, and then you retask the vehicle to go down and take pictures of it. With this vehicle here, it's going off the continental shelf, and there's a lot of um, impacts on ocean temperature, global warming, and so we're creating a, a new data set, a baseline data set to understand what's happening in the frontal lobe of the continental shelf, and that there's a dynamic change in nitrate and uh, temperature. A buoy is only in one spot, and that's a limitation of a buoy. The area is larger and more dynamic. So the, this vehicle can, co can cover 50 kilometers um, in 10 hours. Without the military applications, we wouldn't be able to have the technology to do science. But the applications are you know, so varied, we've helped rediscover the lost, lost eighth wonder of the world. The pink and white terraces of Lake Tarawera in New Zealand. There's these beautiful pink and white silica formations okay. with warm water that's coming down from a, a volcano. Right. And in the 1800s, Westerners would spend 30, 40 days and lots of money, $20,000 at the time, to come down and experience these terraces. and then. In 1886, there was a volcanic eruption, and a lot of people died, and they were lost. And so we went 2011, and we have the ability to penetrate the seafloor with certain instrumentation, and we were able to find them, and they were just buried under the sediment of the lake. But it was a really special project because there was a huge spiritual and cultural aspect to it. With some of the mine countermeasure stuff it is extremely important. Like these vehicles were used in Operation Iraqi Freedom in Port Ankusar to actually help clear out the mine. So. Humanitarian aid can get in really quick, so there's always a you know interesting component to certain projects that makes the job really special too. You know when you're connected with people and you're actually helping to change lives and impacting people.